Well, hi and welcome. We're so glad you joined us for church today. Wherever you are, come on, we're just going to worship together. We're going to lift up the name of Jesus. So come on.
Well, I want to I wanna speak a message that's half of it is kind of what I have shared partly in Heart and Soul, and I, I warned you at Heart and Soul that I was going to turn this into a Sunday message for, uh, for the whole church to be able to hear, and then there is parts in this today that I didn't share on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But I want to open with the same story because it's worth repeating. Uh, but I do want to give the same disclaimer that I gave on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And that is, as I'm about to share this story, parents, I am not giving you permission to lie to your children. I'm not encouraging it. I am not supporting it. I am just being real with you. Is that okay? Have we got any parents here today? All right, lots of parents. Fantastic. Now, a few years ago, when we only had two children, we were living in an apartment, we had the experience that every parent has, and that is the, the silence and the peace of the evening was broken uh, by a, this bell that was ringing in the streets. Now, we know this bell to be called Yemeis, or in Malmö, Hemglas, and, um, you know, and it, like the Pied Piper, they are calling out the children out on the street which is dangerous, to spend your parents' hard-earned money. And I, I remember my children looking at me going, oh, you know, because they heard the bell. And I said to them, what a shame. And they go, what? I said, oh, when they ring the bell, it means they've sold out. <laughs> it means it's empty. And it's kind of a warning for everyone, don't come out, it is empty. Don't judge me, you know it's brilliant. I can still hear the sound of their little broken hearts cracking. And I wanna speak a message today that I've called mixed messages. Mixed messages, let's be honest, we've all experienced mixed messages. You know, that when, those first few days when you're starting, you know, pursuing someone, dating someone, you're sending an SMS, they send one back, and then, you know, if you're a guy, you kinda have no idea what's going on. If you're a girl, you get an SMS and you have to show it to all your friends to figure out what's going on. And, you know, like this mixed messages of figuring out what is the actual, what is he saying? And, you know, what's she saying? Nobody knows. You know, it's these mixed messages or getting that email from your boss and you're trying to figure out, is he angry? Is she sad? Is she happy? Am I getting promoted or fired? I don't know. And, you know, we always say in, in our team, just read the message with a smile on your face and assume that they've got a smile on their face. It changes the whole tone. It's like, you're fired, you know? <laughs> what about traveling to other countries? You know, talk about mixed messages, half English, half Danish, half local language that you've picked up in the airport. And if you don't understand the language, you just yell louder, you know? Because for some reason, every human being thinks that if you yell your confusing language louder, somehow it's gonna make sense to the other person. <laughs> But there is something about relabeling messages. There is something about taking a message that was meant for good, let's say a bell, and relabeling it to something sad. I mean, it's a war strategy that enemies will make so doubt into the mind of their enemies so that even when there is a message of freedom or evacuation or support, that there's so much mistrust that they will not even come to their own people. And it reminds me of a story in the Bible. In 1 Kings, we hear of a guy called Elijah. Elijah, if you don't know the story, don't know the person, Elijah was what we call one of the major prophets. He is, he's, he's the man. I mean, he had crazy miracles, saw amazing things in his life. Matter of fact, when it was time for Elijah to leave the earth, most people would just lie down and die. Elijah never died which is crazy. The Bible says that when it was time for him to die, that a chariot of fire came from heaven and picked him up and took him to heaven. If that's not a boss move, I don't know what is. I was like, okay, I'm out of here. You know, yeah, you can come get me now. So Elijah was just, he was the man. Now in 1 Kings 18, we hear of a situation in Israel. 
You've got King Ahab and you've got a queen called Jezebel. Jezebel was evil, as an evil evil. She, um, she had 850 prophets that would worship these idols and statues, one of them named Baal. And, you know, their, their worship consisted of sacrificing, sacrificed humans and babies. And this is a historic fact. And it, it, it was crazy. It was so evil. And obviously God was not happy. And so God sends Elijah to deal with this situation. And what Elijah does is that he challenges these 850 prophets to a showdown. He says, all right, let's go to the top of this mountain, Mount Carmel, and you build an altar, and I build an altar. And you guys call your gods, and I'll call my God. And whoever's God is the strongest, he will send down fire on this altar. So the 850 prophets, um, Baal prophets, they're building this altar. They start calling out to their gods. Nothing happens. They start cutting themselves and, you know, doing all these crazy things to get the attention of their God. Nothing happens. The Bible actually says at one point, Elijah, he starts teasing them. Not very nice. But he starts yelling out saying, maybe you should yell louder. Maybe your God is on the toilet. (laughs) I love that that's in the Bible. In the end, they give up. Nothing happens. Now it's Elijah's turn. He builds an altar. According to the traditions of the Old Testament, he pours water over it so much that it's just drenched in water. And he says a simple prayer. And as he says, amen, fire falls down and licks up the sacrifice that Elijah had prepared for his God. Now you would think after this, because what Elijah then does is that he goes um, one step further. He goes and he kills every one of these 850 prophets. Um, very Old Testament, very Viking. And as this happens, the news reaches Queen Jezebel. Remember, Queen Jezebel is, she's violent, she's evil, she's angry. She, She hears that her 850 prophets have been killed. And you would think, what is her response going to be? I mean, she, she's just had all these people killed. I mean, she's a violent queen. What's her response going to be? You would think that maybe she's going to send like a thousand of her best soldiers. Maybe you think she's going to send like assassins out to get him. Maybe you think that she's going to, you know, just call an army in. But this is what she does. In 1 Kings 19, verse 1, it says, Now Ahab, the king, told Jezebel, the queen, everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. Isn't that interesting? Jezebel sent a messenger. She didn't send a soldier. She didn't send an assassin. She didn't do anything violent. She sent a messenger. But when thinking about this, there is something familiar about this. Remember, we're talking about mixed messages. There's something familiar about this. If you go back to the garden in Genesis, you got Adam and Eve, perfect relationship with one another, perfect relationship with God. They have this fellowship, and there's only one restriction. God says, just this tree, just leave it alone. Everything else, go for it. But this tree, just leave it alone. And then the snake comes, which is really the devil in the shape of a snake. He comes slithering and says, surely, did God really say? Surely... He didn't mean it like that. And he's trying to sow doubt in terms of the meaning of the word of God. You see, Hebrews 11.3 tells us that our world, both the world, but our world, individual world, is framed by the word of God. So if our world is framed by the word of God, the enemy doesn't just have to attack your world to take you out. The enemy can attack the word of God. He can sow doubt about the Word of God. He can sow doubt about what God has said over your life, what God has said over your family, what God has said over your marriage. He can sow doubt about that and by in in, in consequence have an impact upon your world. Think about Jesus. Jesus, he it says in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus, he fasted for 40 days, 40 nights. And then the Bible, you know, I love sometimes it just becomes Captain Obvious. It says, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and then he was hungry. <laughs> oh, really? Thanks, Sherlock. And then it says that he was led into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. And when we read the story, the Bible tells us that the devil tempted Jesus by quoting, or rather I should say misquoting 
the Bible. Use it, you know, use your power for your own benefit. Use your power for your own good. Worship me and I'll give you all of this. You know, they're again, trying to sow doubt about the word of God. And I have to be honest, I don't think the strategy has changed that much today. If the enemy cannot take out your life, if the enemy cannot take out your relationship with your local church, if the enemy cannot take out your dream or your marriage or your business or whatever it is, what he would try and do is that he would try to redefine it, try to move the boundary stone. And I believe that we are seeing around the world an attack on marriages and on families and on people's relationship with their local church like never before, where there is, a, there is a, an, an attempt to try and redefine. And he comes and he whispers in our mind, you don't, you don't need to go to church to have a relationship with God. You, you, don't, you don't need to read your Bible every day. I mean, an inspirational YouTube video will do just fine. You don't, you don't need to trust God with your finances. You don't need to pray whenever there is a problem. Just first try and fix it and then pray. Just try to redefine our relationship with God. And you will notice that you don't need to change the course very much here and now before long term it has a huge impact. You say today, well, I'm just gonna go this now. I'm just gonna, I used to go to church every Sunday, but now I'm gonna do it every second Sunday. And that's gonna be our new rhythm. And it's amazing how a small change a small change in conviction, a small change in our thinking, a small change in our habits, just a little change has a long-term impact. And that's the thing about the enemy when he comes and lies to us is that often the lie leans up against a truth. It leans up against, it's a half lie, but it's still, you know, it's leaning against up the truth. You know, it's like, yeah, you don't need to go to church every Sunday to have a relationship with God, but we still need church. So it leans up against a truth. And you've got to remember that a half-truth is still a whole lie. A half-truth is still a whole. If you mix truth with a lie, you don't even get a half-truth. You don't get a diluted truth. You get a whole lie with the appearance of truth. I mean, isn't that what clickbait is all about? I mean, isn't that what we see in the media over and over again? Really, I think sensationalism uses the credibility of truth to sell a lie. It, you, it, it steals the credibility of something that is true in order to sell a lie. And the enemy does the same in our lives. It leans up against truth. Proverbs 14, 22, it says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. That's why the Bible warns us in Proverbs 22, 28, do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your ancestors. And I wanna just encourage you today, church, be careful of anything that seeks to redefine something. Be careful of anything that seeks to redefine something, whether it's redefining church, redefining your relationship with God, redefining marriage, redefining your family, redefining your call, redefining anything. Be careful of anything that seeks to redefine something. But also remember, the only one that can redefine something is the one who made it. It's the one who made it. So always check, well, who actually made this? Who came up with this institution? Who came up with this idea? Who came up with this? Like my kids who thought that the sound of a bell was actually negative. <laughs> but in reality, it was very positive. They just had a very horrible dad. I mean, isn't that the same that we see in marriages and, and significant relationships? You know, Phil and Nina, they're talking about they've been married for 10 years. You know, like, it doesn't change. You know, like, you, 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 when, you, when you are in a relationship, you, you're constantly having this conversation between definitions, don't you? You say, well, I said this. Yeah, yeah, but when you say this, I hear it like that. I didn't mean that. I meant this. Yeah, but when you say this with that tone, it means that. I didn't have a tone. I said it like this. Yeah, but when you say this at that time of the day, it means that. What are you talking about? I didn't say this. Yeah, but you said that. I didn't say anything. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, isn't that true for all of us? 
You're trying to find what is the actual meaning. It's like when you go to Jutland, and you know, someone goes like, oh, it's Hals. And you're like, oh, that's okay. But they're like, their world is breaking apart. <laughs> you know, they look at you, go, oh, it's a ring in there. And you're like, oh, he's not happy, but really, his world, oh my gosh. I grew up in Hounding, so I know. Isn't that what happens in church as well? I think people come into church and they bring with them other definitions, other experiences of what everything is. Everything from values to, to what we're talking about. And it's amazing how we can say something and then we come in and, and, and we have already made up our mind about everything because of what we have experienced in the past. But could I, could I just, just throw in a little thought? I know I'm throwing in a lot of thoughts today, but could I throw in another thought? And that is, don't live a life where you're forcing people to prove other people wrong. Can I say that again? Don't live a life where you're trying to force people to prove others wrong. Whether it's a relationship or an old teacher or your parents or something that something was once said to you. Some people, they step into a relationship and without knowing it, the other person is there only to prove all your exes wrong. That relationship is already doomed. Because he or she doesn't know what, what, what they're fighting against. They don't know that when you, they're saying something, it's, it's getting judged against something that was said 10 years ago. We step into workplaces and we step into relationships in our church and we step into volunteer capacity and we don't know, but we're fighting against something that was said or done 10, 15, 20 years ago. You gotta, you gotta allow yourself space and allow the people around you space to grow. Give people grace and space to grow. Even within our own church. You might have been in our church and said, well, I, don't, I didn't learn a bad habit or bad value somewhere else. I got hurt here. And, and that's, that, might be very, that might be true. That might be true that you've hurt yourself in a volunteer capacity or on a leader or connect group leader, something that was set from the platform. But can I encourage you, give us space as well. If you had met me eight years ago, I mean, eight years ago, I was more blunt than I am today. That might be hard for you to believe, but I was. Eight years ago, like, I was kind of rude. Do you know, like, and it, I, I feel, someone back me up, Kat, um, that over the years, I mellowed a little bit. And so you, she's just laughing, my gosh. Space and grace. So you might say, yeah, but you know what? My view on leadership is this, because I met Thomas in 2014. And I'm like, yeah, if I met Thomas in 2014, I would have been annoyed at him too. <laughs> but we gotta give each other space and grace to grow. Give each other space and grace to mature. Give each other room to grow, even within your own marriage. So they did something or said something three years ago or on your honeymoon 20 years ago. Could it be that maybe they have matured in the meantime? Could it be they've learned from their mistakes? Could it be they have grown? Let's give each other space and grace. Is that okay? You know, the truth is we might hear culture, words, and things, they, they, they trigger us because we have seen them or heard about them misused somewhere else. But let me just say this, misused values doesn't dismiss the value. Misused values, it doesn't dismiss the actual value. Like I think one of the biggest things that we often hear about in a church context is when we talk about finances, money, cash. And you know, like it becomes a trigger. People like, you know, moving in their seat and getting all awkward and fidgety and looking around. It's like, oh, why did I bring a friend on a heart for the house Sunday? You know, and because we're talking about money. And why? Because somewhere out there on some movie or some show or something we've heard about, someone is misusing finances. So now I guess all pastors are misusing finances. I guess all churches are all about money because we've heard someone somewhere at some time, misused it. And suddenly it becomes this trigger. And I guess a lot of people, the way they deal with it, it becomes that awkward thing that we don't never talk about. Oh yeah, we've got some bills that need to be paid. I hope someone will pay it. You will notice in our church, we kind of just take on the elephant in the room. 
you know, because I think it's just better to take on the elephant in the room and just talk about it. I remember reading um, the biography of the evangelist Billy Graham, and he was asked in an interview about some pastor that had done something immoral. And the journalist asked him, what do you think about this? And Billy Graham, he said, you know, every single day, thousands upon thousands of planes take off and land safely. Yet we only talk about the one that crashes. It is so easy to start judging everyone because all pastors are like that, or all men are like that, all women are like that. No, most people are actually good. Most people are actually good people. Most men are actually good men. Most women are actually good women. And most pastors are actually good pastors. You know, most people are actually just trying to do the best they can with what they have. But unfortunately, we hear about the one. And it paints and taints the picture of the all. You know, we... Um, Saying here, someone misusing a value doesn't dismiss the value. And at church, we say that at, at, at Hillsong, you can serve with your time and your talent and, and treasure. Now, I will say this, and I said this on, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday as well, at Heart and Soul. I said, you know, if you ever feel pressured, don't. Like, don't. You're allowed to come to our church your whole life, you know, without ever lifting a finger, without ever giving a single kroner into church. It's fine. You know, that it, it's for everyone. And so you should never feel, pre if, if, if us putting a picture up of Afghanistan saying, hey, could you help with this, that you feel pressured, don't. Like seriously, don't. The church has survived many things throughout the years, and it will survive your lack of involvement in this, in this field. And so if there's ever a sense of you feel coerced or manipulated, I'm, you can hear it from the horse's mouth. I'm the horse. You can hear it from my mouth. Do not feel pressured. Okay, you are welcome. You're welcome. That's one of the reasons I don't know who gives what in our church. I don't want to know because I don't want to look at people different. Okay, so don't ever feel, but what I will say, all of us have a responsibility as Christians just to figure out what does the Bible say? What does it say about serving? What does it say about giving? What does it say about bringing? What does it say about worship? What does it say about the Word of God? What does it say about the local church? And then make up your own mind. But my question to church would be, should I hold back from teaching something I believe is biblical and that I believe is given to our benefit because someone else is misusing it. No, that would not be fair on you. That would not be fair on our church. Because someone around the world is doing something stupid, does that mean that we should not talk about it? No, I, I believe that God has principles when it comes to our finances. God has principles when it comes to our marriages. God has principles when it comes to prayer, when it comes to attending church. God has principles in place for all of us. And a misused value doesn't dismiss the value. Can, can I go a little bit deeper? Cut a little bit closer? This one's gonna hurt. It hurts saying it and it will, be hurt, it will hurt hearing it. Just because the doctor is sick doesn't mean the prescription was wrong. Just because the doctor is sick doesn't mean the prescription was wrong. Look, I've seen heroes fall. I've seen leaders stumble. I've seen my own personal heroes fall. And I've been hurt in the process. I've been part of church life, local church life, my whole life. And I, I guess I've, I think I've seen it all. <laughs> I've at least seen a lot of it. And I've experienced a lot of it. And now and then, I don't know how you find it, but I find like social media, I find cyberspace, if you will, you know, the internet. I find it, I find it like to be an ocean. Uh, you know, like how the tide, you know, the waves bringing driftwood of just random stuff. I feel like that's the internet for me. You know, you're, just, you're minding your own business, you know, watching someone's social media or watching a movie or watching a highlight or something, and suddenly the cyberspace just brings in some driftwood. <laughs> hey, you should watch this. And it's like, what is this? And sometimes some content will appear from one of my fallen heroes. And I don't know about you, but I'm just being completely honest now. But I sit there and I sometimes look at it drift in and I go, hmm, I remember when they said that. I remember when they wrote that. And when they said it, when they wrote it at the time, man, it blessed me so much. 
But now that I know what I know about them, what do I do with this? Anyone else with me on this? You're kind of like, what do I do with this? Because that book helped me. That sermon set me free. That thought, it revolutionized my leadership. So what do I do with this? What value do words from fallen heroes have? Then I think about my own life. I think about myself, and I think about the Apostle Paul, who says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. I guess all of us have to re remember there are no, there's, there's no such thing as a superhuman. If anything, we are all just super human. <laughs> and it's amazing how God can use anyone. You know, you think through the Bible and you have a prostitute named Rahab that became part of the lineage of Jesus. You had a murderer called David who became King David. You had someone persecuting the Christians that became Apostle Paul. You had the doubter Thomas, the denier Peter. You had these crazy people. You even had a donkey. And I'm not talking about Shrek. We had a donkey in the Bible where God spoke through. Could it be that if God can use all of them, that he can use me and he can use you? Now, I'm not saying that how we live doesn't matter. I'm just saying it's not all that matters, that there is more to it. If I get Alex up here, just to twinkle, twinkle. How I wonder what you are. What about you? What mixed messages have you heard? Maybe about you. If the enemy can't take you out, he can try and change the definitions. And I think one of the, oh, oh, oh don't come. <laughs> That's cool. I've heard something about me. <laughs> come on, give it up, Alex. <laughs> I think one of the biggest lies that people are told over and over again is that you are what you do and you are what you've done. And let me just, the last few minutes of this service, let me just say three quick things. Number one, you are not what you do. You, you need to hear this. You are not what you do. Whether what you do is impressive, whether what you do is successful, or the opposite. You are not what you do. Your identity, your purpose, your value is not based on your success or the lack of it, on your affluence or the lack of it, your influence or the lack of it. You are not what you do. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I praise you because I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. You are not what you do. Second thing, you are not what you have done. You are not what you have done. So many people, they don't live free. They don't live at peace because they're riddled with guilt or shame, regrets of things they have done in the past. But you are not your mistake. You are not your mistake. Now you can become that if you don't make some changes. If that becomes a habit and that becomes, then slowly you can become that. But you are not your mistake. You are not what you have done. Psalm 139 verse five in the Passion Translation says, you've gone into my future to prepare the way and in kindness, I want you to hear this next line, and in kindness you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. You are not what you have done. And the last thing, you are not what has been done to you. You are not what has been done to you. There's an old analogy that anyone that's grown up in a youth ministry would know. <laughs> this is 50 Corona, Malmö. It's about 500 krona. (Laughter) 
I can step on it. I can kick it. I can spit on it, but I won't. I can scrunch it up. I can forget about it. I can leave it behind. I can find it in the dirt and pick it up later. But this remains worth 50 kroner no matter what I do to it. The value doesn't change. Church, listen to me. You are not what has been done to you. You've been lied to, you've been cheated on, abused, misused. Whatever's happened to you, that's not who you are. That might have been done to you, but that is not who you are. Psalm 139, listen to this, word of God. I'm not gonna add, I'm not gonna take away, I'm just gonna read 18 verses to you and then we'll finish. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every moment of my heart and soul and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You're so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book and you know all the words I'm about to speak. Before I even start a sentence, you know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare a way and in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. You've laid your hand on me. This is just too wonderful, deep and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I run and hide from your face? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you're there too. If I fly with the wings into the shining dawn, you're there. And if I fly into the radiant sunset, you're there waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me. Your strength will empower me. It's impossible to disappear from you or to ask the darkness to hide me. For your presence is everywhere, bringing light into my night. There is no such thing as darkness with you. The night to you is as bright as the day. There is no difference between the two. You form my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intrinsic outside and wove them all together in my mother's womb. Thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it, how thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully. You shaped me from nothing to something. You saw me. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you were thinking of me. How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires towards me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I wake each morning, you are still with me. That is who you are. You're wonderfully made. You're not what you do, you're not what you've done, and you are not what has been done to you. Don't let anyone that didn't make you try and define you. God made you, He defines you, and that is His definition of you. But I wonder, church, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know God? Are you here today for the first time in any of our locations and you're like, what's this? Yet even in the confusion, your heart is drawn. You cannot be around the presence of God without being drawn in. That is why it matters showing up because the worship, the presence of God, it, 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 it draws us in. Do you know Him? Maybe you once did, but you, got, you start believing the lies, you start believing the wrong definitions, and now you're finding yourself trying to prove yourself to God because you think you are what you do. No. That's why the Bible says that we come to Him by faith, through grace. It is simply just choosing to believe what He has done for us. In that moment, we find peace, 
we find purpose. We find forgiveness. We find hope. So I'd love just to ask everyone just to close your eyes, just to give everyone a moment around you, just privacy. There's no one talking, no one disturbing the person next to you. Do you know Jesus? I would love to pray for anyone here today that you say today, Thomas, I want to say yes to Jesus. I, 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 wanna, I want this relationship with a God, a God that thinks of me like this. I want that. So I'm just going to ask you, if that's you, if you're saying, Thomas, when you pray for people, I'm not going to embarrass you, I'm not going to point you out, I just want to pray for you where you are, whatever location, whatever room you are right now, even online. If you're saying today, Thomas, when you pray for people to say yes to Jesus, could you include me in that prayer? Could you think of me? If that's you, I just want you right now without any hesitation, just to quickly lift up your hand so I know who I'm praying for. Just lift it up, just high enough and long enough for me to see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone else here? In other locations as well? Anyone else? Just say, that's me. There's something powerful about making an external motion of an internal decision. This is more than just a feeling. I'm making a choice. Jesus, I need you. In class, we, in school, we learn, if I got a question, put up your hand. If you got the answer, put up your hand. We learn, if you're at the beach and you need help, put up your hand, let us know. If you need help today, you need Jesus today, just put up your hand. And I wanna pray for you, thank you. It's awesome, it's awesome. Okay, you can put your hands down. That's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together. And I want to ask everyone to say this prayer together in every location, every service. Just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my mistakes and my sin. But today, I choose you. I make you my Lord and Savior. And from today, I am forgiven. I'm a follower of Jesus and I am free. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Come on, can we congratulate? Come on, can we celebrate every person making this decision? Beautiful. Beautiful. Before I talk to you guys that have just made a decision, I want to pray for one more group of people. You are not what you do. You are not what you've done. And you are not what has been done to you. I wonder which one rings true for you. I wonder which one today you need to believe God to set you free from. The striving, the constantly trying to win over affection, not only from God, but from people around you. You're not what you do. You are not what you do. The, the shame, the guilt from the past, mistakes haunting you, if they find out, if they ever knew who I really was, they're never gonna love me. You are not what you've done. And then the pain of what's been done to you. I can't talk about it. I can't, no one would understand. You're not what you've done. You are not what you've done. So whatever you're going through, whatever you're carrying around, can I say it's not yours to carry? It's not yours to carry. Don't let shame keep you away from your healing. And don't let pride keep you away from your healing. That's why we're here as a church. You're not a burden. You're not disturbing us by saying, hey, I just got some stuff I need to walk through. I got some stuff I just need to, I've been carrying this for too long. It's not what Jesus says. Come to me, those of you who are tired, weary, heavy burdened. Come and live free. Live free. So just with every eye closed, we're gonna pray for all three groups in one go because then we don't know who's responding to what. But just, let's just close our eyes one more time. If that's you, one of those three, it responds to you. And it can come out in your relationship. It can come out in your, even being in church, some of the things we talked about today, or just in life in general. But if that's you, one of those three, and today you just wanna make a decision, I wanna be free. I'm letting go. I'm letting go. And then I'm gonna take the next step. I'm gonna be courageous and take the steps needed. But right now, I'm making a decision. I'm letting go. And I'm choosing to take on the definition that God has for me. If that's you, can you just lift your hand? 
you're not alone, church. You're not alone. So many hands, most hands up. And I'm only saying that so you know you're not alone. Other locations. Jesus, 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 we thank you that you say that we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. So Lord, right now, I just pray that we will accept and we will know the truth, that you love us just the way we are, yet you love us too much to leave us the way that we are, and that you want to take every single one of us on a journey to holistic freedom. So Lord, whether it's something that we need to free ourselves from the striving, from the trying to work in order to be accepted by God and man, Lord, I pray that people will realize their value in who you say they are people that are constantly clinging on to the shame and the regret of the past, Lord God. Lord, may they experience freedom, freedom in their life, Lord God, healing from the past. We thank you that you guide them and you guard them, Lord God, from the past and those that are in this prison, Lord God, of unforgiveness and from things that haven't been healed and dealt with yet from the past, of things that have been done to them, words spoken over, actions done to them, Lord God. Lord, I pray as they take the necessary steps, Lord God, of freedom, that they will learn to let go, not so others can get away with it, but so that they can get away from it. Lord, we thank you that today will be the first day of people's journey towards their freedom, Lord God. We thank you marriages are going to be free. Individuals are going to be free. Children are going to grow up with parents that are free. We thank you, Lord God, for who you say we are, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. I just want to say, and I know that I'm touching on a whole bunch of stuff right now, call it trigger, call it things that you, you know, come to mind, and, and I know that it's not always nice to be talking like this because you, memories are flooding back, things are flooding back, and um, I just want to say that you do not have to walk this walk alone. You don't have to suffer in silence. We have an amazing pastoral care team. We have amazing people. And, you know, some are qualified, you know, to have the, those conversations that are needed. But you know what? At the end of the day, we're also here just to do the journey with you while you're talking with maybe a therapist or psychologist or whatever it might be that you need. I'm not going to make assumptions. But whatever it is that you need to walk this out, we would love just to come alongside you. And, you know, just do that journey with you. And maybe on a day like today, it's, it can be a little bit awkward to walk down to someone because everyone's going to know I'm talking to someone and now it's no longer a friendly conversation. And, you know, every, you, know you, you have all these thoughts, which I'm just saying, don't. It's okay. Okay? But otherwise, just email us at care at hillsong.dk. Care at hillsong.dk. Just email us and say, hey, I'd love just to have a conversation about some of the things that were talked about on Sunday. And we'd love just to set up a time and have a coffee with you or come down after the service and come and talk to us and we'd love to have that conversation with us. We have our pastoral care team here in Copenhagen. They'll be, you know, here side of stage in our other locations. They will be there as well. Just come down and talk to us. We'd love to do that journey with you. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay. Hey, those of you who lifted your hand before, just connecting your life with Jesus. First of all, massive congratulations. Man, it is so good. We're so happy for you. And we know the, the potential of this decision. And like we said, we, we believe that God, He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you a purpose. And uh, we want to help you step up from here. First of all, we would love to give you a Bible. It's a gift from us to you. And so on the way out, we have our amazing team with these Bible pickup signs in every location, in every room, wherever you are. If you're online, you got to email us, but that's okay. Um, we're not in your house. You would find that weird, and that would be breaking the law. So we're not going to do that. But here in our buildings, in our services, we have our amazing team. Just walk up to them. We have Bibles in Danish, English, or Swedish. And uh, just walk up and say, I love one of those free Bibles. And then I just want to encourage you, keep coming back. Keep coming back. Why don't you make a decision? Next four Sundays, I'm going to be in church. And you watch just in four Sundays how there's not already just a change in the way you think, change in the way you feel, change in the way you believe as you're setting a new trajectory for your life. Is that okay? So come on. Can we give all those people one more hand? You guys are amazing. Come on. Why don't we, why don't we stand to our feet? 
we're about to let the other locations go. Um, but before we do that, we're just going to pray for everyone. And then we're going to go after this. Obviously, we've got a church picnic here in Copenhagen. Leslie will be in a Lelsugel in a box bike being transported over there. Because her and Jesper, they completed their very first triathlon yesterday. Congratulations on Friday. It felt like yesterday. Yes, there you go. And uh, other locations as well. We've got things happening after the service. So just hang around. And uh, let's just continue to expand our community. Is that okay? But let me pray for you. Jesus, we just thank you so much. We thank you, Lord God, for everything you are and what you do. The Bible says that you are good and what you do, it is good. And so, Lord, we just speak that over every single person here today. May your goodness just be shown in people's lives, Lord God. We just pray for favor over people's lives, Lord God. Where there is lack, we thank you for your provision. Where there is sickness, we thank you that you are God who heals. Where there is breakdown in relationships, we thank you that you are God who reconciles and restores. And Father, we lift up our friends and our family members and the people in our world who still do not know you. Lord, just give us the wisdom, give us the know-how, Lord Jesus, in order to bring that invitation out, Lord God, that they might come and see for themselves, that they too might have an encounter with you, Lord God. So we just give you all the glory and all the praise for what you're doing in and through our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said together, amen. amen. Come on, can we thank Jesus ahead of time? So good.